This video is sponsored by Upper Story. More about them later. On the 25th of April 2018, the Copernicus Sentinel 3B satellite was launched from the Plesetsk Cosmodrome. After clearing the atmosphere over the course of several weeks, it fired its thrusters to position itself in a sun synchronous orbit, 500 miles above the surface. Once in this position, it orbited the Earth every 100 minutes, sweeping the entire surface area every 27 days. The satellite and its instruments formed just part of the European Space Agency's monitoring of Earth's climate, adding to datasets of temperature, wildfire activity, and many more variables that have been collected for decades. But before that new data could be added to existing climate datasets, it had to go through a rigorous verification process. And for good reason. So many decisions being made today are based on observations of the Earth's climate, which scientists find alarming. The impacts of these decisions are vast, and so we have to be absolutely absolutely sure we are basing them on the best data possible. To that end, in 1992, the Global Climate Observing System was established in cooperation with organizations like the World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environment Programme. They decided on 55 key variables to characterize the Earth's climate, which merited specific standardized monitoring, and they called them essential climate variables. They define a list of 55 variables, also called essential climate uh, variables. This is a group of variables that represent climate at best. And we have 55 of them distributed in the different compartments of the Earth system, in the atmosphere, in the ocean, and over uh, the land. This is Dr. Clément Abagel, a scientist at the European Space Agency's Climate Office. And the Climate Office's job is to create long-term global data sets of those ECVs. More than half of them can uh, benefit from satellite Earth observation, and some of them can entirely rely on Earth observation. So developing this core group of variables is at the, the core of ESA's climate change uh, initiative. However, the tricky part is that the data for a specific variable, like say ground temperature, can come from multiple sources, multiple satellites, that more often than not overlap in time. But why is that a problem? Imagine that you want to record a piece of live music, so you set up a microphone and hit record. But it quickly becomes clear that your microphone is about to run out of battery, so you scramble around and get your backup microphone and hit record. There's some overlap between the second microphone being turned on and the first one dying. However, it turns out that your second microphone is also nearly out of charge, and the piece isn't finished yet. So you go to your backup backup microphone and set that recording too. Again, there's some overlap between the second and third microphones. Finally, the piece finishes, and you're left with three different recordings using three different microphones of the same piece. Together, they form a complete recording, but they all sound slightly different. How do you combine them in a seamless recording of the whole piece? No, I think that what we have to keep in mind is that there is no satellite uh, mission that lasts uh, forever. So what we want to develop is long time series. And only long time series can be useful for uh, to study uh, climate. So it's very important to put together information from various uh, instruments to try to obtain uh, harmonized uh, time series of essential climate variable. Surface soil moisture is uh, one of them. And in order to develop a global time series of soil moisture spanning from 1978 to the current time, we needed to put together information from 17 uh, sensors that are flying up there. I mean, different sensors will observe the same variables, but in different uh, conditions, with different uh, specific. One can be biased compared to the other. So we need to uh, develop techniques to be able to remove this bias so we can uh, appreciate the variables in time. Uh-oh, B word. B we got the B word. Bias. In everyday language, we say that something or someone is biased if they have an inclination towards or a prejudice against a particular group of people or a particular conclusion. For example, we might say that a hiring firm has a similarity bias if they only hire people who look like they do. Or if a newspaper only publishes articles about peer-reviewed research into how the climate is rapidly changing and no articles about how scientists are woke, we might say they have a bias towards reality. People here removing bias in a climate context and assume that means that scientists are cherry-picking and removing data such that it matches a conclusion that they have come to in advance. And that's simply not true, and it comes down to language. In a statistical context, bias means something very different. It simply means a statistical deviation of an observation from reality. 
For example, imagine you have a measuring jug with markings on the side. Because of a printing error, however, the markings are slightly too high. When you fill it with water to the 100 milliliter line, you've actually filled it with 110 milliliters of water. You could verify this by weighing the volume of water you've poured into the jug. In other words, using a verification measurement. The measuring jug is still useful, it's just biased by 10 milliliters. Any measurement you make with it just needs to have that bias removed. When scientists talk about removing biases, this is what they're talking about. Verifying the accuracy of a new measurement with another already calibrated form of measurement, and then subtracting any bias that's been identified from new measurements made by that new method. There's nothing nefarious about it. And note that the verification process isn't always perfect. In fact, I did a video a few years ago on how satellites were underestimating the warming trend in Africa because of verification issues, but I digress. Before the data from Sentinel-3b can be added to the existing dataset of ground surface temperatures, it has to be validated using in situ measurements. It has to have its bias removed. And that's not something done by hand. Scientists like Clemmer are not going in and changing individual numbers to match some predetermined conclusion, like, I don't know, a warming trend. And that's because it would take way too long. We want to have that as uh, automated as, uh, as possible. You, you always need a last human quality uh, check, at least, uh, at least for now. But uh, yes, also to, uh, having uh, automated uh, activities such as with this one permit to limit the possibility to have uh, an error. So to go back to our analogy of recording a piece of live music using multiple microphones, each microphone has a bias. In this specific case, we could just say that our first microphone is the correct level, and so we adjust the levels of each subsequent microphone to match the first, something we can easily do because of the overlaps between the microphones. But what if instead of using one microphone at a time, you had a whole array of them? Multiple microphones at once, dropping, in and out, all with different biases. At a given time, what is the correct measurement? And what if these slightly different microphones measure bass and treble frequencies slightly differently, or pick up on these slightly different parts of the room? It's a really hard problem, made harder by the fact that there is a true answer to look for, and getting this right has huge impacts on global decision making. This is what it's actually like trying to create a long-term climate dataset. Instead of microphones, you have satellites, and instead of a musical group, you have 55 different but related climate variables. But we also have a period of time, more uh, recently, where we have to combine all this information to obtain a single value of uh, soil moisture at its location uh, of Earth. And to be clear, that's not easy. <laughs> that's not easy. No, that's not easy and it requires a lot of development and algorithm and also choice on how to use uh, this data rather than the other. It's not as simple as making a big uh, average of all the data you have at one point in, uh, in time. The specifics of how you do that are, to be completely honest, not very interesting. They're just a bunch of predetermined algorithms and statistics designed to match satellite observations with those that are taken on the ground. It's a verification process that involves multiple biases for each satellite. Unfortunately though, where some people see dense, boring statistics like that, they see a smokescreen for nefarious activity. Just this summer, online there was quite a bit of confusion, mostly spread by unqualified influencers about the difference between ground temperature, which is measured by Sentinel-3b, and air temperature, or two meter temperature, which is not. Sentinel-3 has a radiometer that measures land surface temperature that is not air temperature at the meteorological sense, but rather the amount of energy that is radiating from the Earth, how it will feel uh, to the touch. In a uh, summer clear sky condition, land surface temperature, depending on the cover, on the color of the cover, on the, the cloud fraction or the wind, land surface temperature can be way higher than uh, 2 meter uh, temperature. The difference between those two measurements led to claims that ESA was trying to scaremonger about climate change. Claims that spread online like wildfire. Like the wildfire that was actually spreading across Europe due to 2023 being the warmest summer on record. Watching this controversy 
from the outside was immensely frustrating, because to me, as an observer, it was pretty clear that, at the very least, some of the confusion was deliberately manufactured by climate sceptics, either mislabeling figures or being ambiguous about which variable was being used in a particular figure. Although, you know, some of it probably was just genuine confusion. These are two quite similar but very distinct variables, and humans are fallible. It could be it could be a bit of both. I would uh, I would say we always have to be very careful when we have a new type of information uh, and to bet to understand uh, the context and where does it come from. And I agree that if someone is providing a fake news or delib deliberately uh, willing to take an information out of its uh, context, it's quite uh, easy to create uh, some wrong information and to attract a lot of uh, of attention. But it has never been the intention of uh, Isa to bring uh, confusion. That sentence right there is why I wanted to make this video. Because ESA's Climate Office and other Earth observation organizations are not interested in coming to some predetermined conclusion. They're certainly not interested in spreading confusion. Their sole purpose is to observe the Earth system in as much accuracy as possible and report what they find. That's it. They don't get any more money for finding any particular findings. They have no incentive to choose algorithms or manipulate the data to be anything other than the most accurate representation of the Earth system possible. Removing the biases from each sensor, from each satellite, and combining them to give the scientific community the highest quality information possible. If there were any biases on display this summer, they weren't from satellites. They were from commentators online, determined to deny the science that the Earth is warming. It is because we have the Global Climate Observing System and the long-term datasets from ESA and elsewhere that we know the climate is warming, far faster than anything in the historical record. And that wasn't a conclusion that scientists came to and then found the data to support. It's what the data showed us from space, but also on the ground, over and over and over again. And I can assure you that no climate scientist is happy about all what we see uh, currently in the, in the news. So we would prefer uh, a different outcome for sure. Hopefully one day the Sentinel program and its successors will document a planet that, instead of warming more and more, stabilizes its temperature and eventually cools adding to a really impressive temperature dataset that hopefully you now understand a little bit better. As some of you know, recently my wife and I welcomed our first child into the world. And obviously one of the big perks of having a kid is you get to spend more time playing with toys. Some of the best toys are the ones you used to get at the science museum gift shop. If you're anything like me, you used to go to a science museum and you'd see something really cool that was like a demonstration of a concept in physics or chemistry or engineering that you just saw in the museum, but as a toy, and you almost never got to take it home. Hold those toys in your mind, because this video is sponsored by Upper Story and their Spintronics kit, which updates those toys to the modern day and makes me really excited for two reasons. Firstly, I always struggled with circuits when I was a student. It took me ages to get the physical difference between current and voltage. And Spintronics makes those kinds of distinctions really obvious by using physical components to create a mechanical analog of an electronic circuit. Instead of wires, it uses chains. That's your battery. So if I pull it, there's no resistance. So this is just gonna short. Yep. <laughs> These are your resistors. That's 500 ohms. 1000 ohms and they're gonna resist motion, that's gonna resist more than that will. That's the ammeter. Oh, that must be the capacitor. That's your switch. Oh yeah, so that doesn't move. Now it does. Right, hang on, let's make a simple circuit. Let's make a simple circuit. This is the first time I've seen electronics taught in such a practical, physical way. And it really works. It takes concepts that are very abstract and it makes them tangible. And this is something that Upper Story have history with. Their previous product was Turing Tumble, which was an award-winning marble-powered computer that they used to teach computer science. I've got another plate and it clips in, pops in, and then twist. And then... Magnets! <laughs> Put the loop around the, the top. Ah! <laughs> I love it! So because you've got resistance to the voltage that you're applying, you don't get infinite current, you don't short it out, it actually has a stable current. We do that and then we pop the ammeter on the top and then this should... 
Oh, this is so good. This is so clever. The box contains a puzzle book with steampunk narrative elements and setups for puzzles as well as the components used. And you can do these puzzles solo or collaboratively. It's a really unique way to teach this stuff. And when Upper Story reached out, I couldn't say yes fast enough because it's just so innovative. It's exactly the kind of toy that I would have loved to have played with when I was a kid. And frankly, as an adult now, I'm gassed to go through these puzzles. They're not just for kids. But looking to the future, the other reason I was so excited for this sponsorship is this is exactly the kind of thing I cannot wait to play collaboratively with my daughter. Appropriate for ages eight to adult, if you would like to learn or teach electronics in a mechanical way, head to upperstory.com slash spintronics. And if you use the code Simon Clark, all caps, you'll get 10% off. That's upperstory.com slash spintronics, with thanks to Upper Story for sponsoring this video and for giving Pixel Baby a really cool toy. Thank you so much for watching, and of course, thank you to Clement at the European Space Agency, along with Paul and Suzanne. You guys were wonderfully generous with your time. Thank you for allowing me to make this video. The names you're seeing on the screen right now are some of my executive producer patrons who saw some behind the scenes of my filming trip at the European Space Agency in the monthly vlog that I make exclusively for my patrons. If you'd like to support the channel and help me make more and better content and get exclusive stuff in return, then there's a link to my Patreon in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please do pop it a like and and give it a share on your socials. In fact, why not give it a share with that person in your life who you think could do with hearing the content of this video. If you'd like to watch something next, here's some recommended viewing. And that just leads me to say thank you again for watching. I'll see you in the next one.